have two speakers with us. Um, and I'm not sure the order among the two of you. Andy Shapiro and all right, I'm say it right, Angela Ojanaki. All right, good. So I'll, I'll um, double up food bucks. If you were here last night, you had a chance to hear from Oren Hesterman, who's the, the director of the program, but now we're going to get to hear a little more about the guts of the double up food, uh, food box program. So I'll leave it to the two of you to kind of share the, the microphone. All right, so yeah, hopefully you all heard a little bit about the program yesterday and um, actually after this session, Andy and I will be going more in depth into the Double Up Food Bucks if you want to dive a little bit deeper into that. Um, but basically it's a program that matches SNAP dollars for Michigan grown produce at participating farmers markets and grocery stores. Um, and we are a statewide program now that started in just five farmers markets in Detroit. Um, and this year we had 155 markets and 91 grocery stores. We work primarily with independent grocery stores um, and also one chain across the state. Um, and like Orrin said, it's a win-win-win solution. So we're trying to make healthy food, fresh fruits and vegetables more affordable, particularly for our lowest income community um, who receive SNAP. Um, and then we're um, that uh, those federal food dollars are going directly to local farmers, so supporting our um, local farm community and just keeping those um, federal food dollars circulating within our local food economy. Yeah. So I'm going to just talk a bit about kind of what we've been doing in terms of policy here in the state. And if you have questions about federal, um, feel free to ask when we open up to questions. I just want to focus on that for the state for now, and but as Folks know I, I'm happy to answer all the questions about federal policy as well. So, um, in the state level, we have received two appropriations in the past for statewide funding for double three bucks in 2017. It was two separate appropriations that totaled 1.5 million dollars that the state gave us through the Department of Health and Human Services, um, and two supplemental appropriations, which if you know. Anything about budget processes, supplementals are where the legislators throw things that they didn't get in the full budget in, usually as negotiations go through with governors, or if there's pipeline funding that hasn't been so funding that hasn't spent been spent by departments and they actually have surpluses of funding, they'll throw that money into supplemental budgets that aren't the full state budget for each year. And so we got two of those in 2017. And it, supplementals are great, and also they are really ad hoc and at the whim of the legislators. You can have, usually you never have zero supplementals in a year, but you can have one, some years you have four or five. Um, so it's just kind of all over the place. So building up to this year, we've been working really hard to get funding actually in the full state budget, which in theory will be passed on Monday at 11.59 p.m. because it's not the state shuts down. So in theory, we'll have a budget or we won't. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> We're, you know, clocks at like 54 hours or whatever. So we're getting close. Um, we have in the budget that was passed by the Senate and the House, in the egg budget this time, um, $1 million of recurring funding for double up food box, which is super exciting because um, in contrast to supplementals, recurring line items help people, it's a starting place for each budget negotiation. To make clear, that does not mean that things stay as, per, there's no such thing as permanent law, there is no such thing as permanent budget line items, they could write it out when they start again in January because they gave themselves no time to have a break. So they're going to start budget negotiations for this year, 2021, January 1. Probably not even. They'll probably start October 1 if the government shuts down, doesn't shut down. And so it's a, but it's at least a way for when they start those negotiations, our line item is included in those negotiations and included in the original conversations. It still takes a lot of advocacy to get there and to make sure that it's passed, but it's it's a start in terms of getting it in when they start discussing the budget, it's part of the original and starting conversations. So how did we get here? Well, um, as some of you may know, Michigan has a full-time legislature, so they work 
all year round. <laughs> I don't know how much credit we should get for them for that. I'm not sure. Um, three days a week, all year round, with like three months worth of breaks. So if I had that scheduled, that'd be awesome. But um, they also are term limited. So this year, starting this year, there were a bunch of new folks, both in the Senate and the House. Some of the, some of the Senate folks had served in the House previously, maybe four years ago, maybe 10 years ago, maybe just in the past term. And some are brand new. They've never served either at the state level, some have come from county or city councils, and some have never served in politics before ever. And so it's an interesting process of working to educate the, the specific people who are important to the budget for us, which is the Department of Agriculture, finding those legislators, taking them on site visits to see sites for double up food bucks, having to meet the farmers, meet the people who use snack and double up and having them talk with them directly, um, market managers at farmers markets, grocery owners at grocery stores, so trying to connect them with the people in their district that are impacted by the program. Um, because they come in in January, they're, they're um, sworn in January 1, and suddenly they're push, put in front of them a budget, right? A state budget that many of them don't even know how to read a state budget, let alone figure out what should be in it, what shouldn't be in it. The same is true with the governor, right? She served for 14 years in the state legislature um, in both the House and the Senate, but, is that right? Yeah, you can um, but she's never been a governor before, right? So she's, she also was sworn in on January 1, had to learn everything and present a budget by March 5th. So it's been a lot of education, really targeted education and engagement with specific folks in specific districts, targeting the legislators who were most impactful for our ask, because with all 148 of the legislators, 38 in the Senate and 110 in the, set, in the House, they, they are so bogged down by what else is happening. They, they are trying to find the bathroom. They're trying to like, learn how to read weeklies. Like, they can't focus on so many new programs that we were really targeted and did not do a large grassroots campaign. And so there are pros and cons to all of it, of course, in that now for next year, let's say that they wanted to switch us from the Department of Agriculture to the Department of Health and Human Services, back to the Department of Health and Human Services, we haven't necessarily met those legislators, right? It's a whole new campaign to get them educated because we've targeted <coughs> the six to 10 most important for the Department of Agriculture in addition to the governor. And so it's been really targeted and focused, but there can be drawbacks, of course, when, when and if you potentially need to broaden that scope. So that's kind of what we've been doing. I'm happy to dig more into it, but now I think we turn over to Diane. Okay. Can I just ask you? I'm going to ask you a question right now. But, um, so, um, oh, so Double Up oh, Bucks is run by Fair Food Network. Just, oh. um, I managed to figure out the policy manager at Fair Food Network. <laughs> 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 That's my job. That first slide that shows who the organizations are briefly. <coughs> Sorry, I, yes. You know, those are who we're hearing from. Fair Food Network. That's a great question. <laughs> Thank you for drawing me back out of my <laughs> wherever I was going. <laughs> and, <laughs> and as Andy said at the top, or Angela, I think said, so Fair Food Network is both federal, a federal program, and then you were just talking about the state on yes, one yeah. aspect. So that's something kind of unique about the work there. Um, do you want to move move on to Diane Connors, who works at Groundwork Center here in Michigan, on the um, ten cents a meal program, which is absolutely a state program? You want to yeah, you know, yeah. Oh, yeah, we have that. <laughs> this is the clicker, or the oh, clicker? yeah, I got it here. Okay. Um, well, so. The importance of this slide is that it is a website called 10centsmichigan.org, and there are resources there that you see lined up here and many more, and I'll be talking about some of them as I, I talk about what our approach has been um, in terms of engagement uh, on policy advocacy. And 
I really want to go back sort of to the beginning for us. Um, I remember getting one day at work at Groundwork Center, which is a nonprofit here in Traverse City, where we've been working on uh, farm to school initiatives throughout our region for 15 years now. And one day I saw, you know how you, those emails will float up while you're trying to work on a Word document? I saw one come up from Mark Coe, who's from Michigan Farm to Freezer, which uh, he's a former farmer and now he was working um, on this initiative to get uh, buy locally grown farm pro products and freeze them so that schools and others can use them year round. I saw another email float up from Tom Freitas, who is the food service director for Travis City Area Public Schools. And I'm trying to do good time management and I sort of let that float away and continue on my work. And then I get a text from Tom Freitas at Travis City Schools, which I had never gotten a text from him before in my life. So I decided. Okay, I think I'll pay attention to this. And they had just had Senator Boer um, talking to the two of them. And Mark, in particular, I know is a is a uh, active Farm Bureau member and was cultivating relationships with Senator Boer. And they talked to him about um, what they were doing, and he wanted to know. Well, you know, are there any policies that I could move forward that would be helpful to you? And they both brought up 10 cents a meal. And 10 cents a meal was a pilot project that we had started in our region with the goal of inspiring the legislature to adopt it so that we can have a statewide program available to all school districts and all kids in the state of Michigan. Um, and so we were testing it out, and it was the idea that if we were to provide an extra matching 10 cents a meal for schools to purchase Michigan-grown fruits and vegetables. And trying to test out that model of what kind of difference does a dime make when schools have such tight school budgets. And so Senator Brewer was really excited about that. And they said, well, if you want to know the nuts and bolts of how it works, you need to talk to Diane. And so I talked to the senator and um, talked to him about how it worked. He really wanted to try to get this to be a program in the state of Michigan and have it start out as a pilot, not statewide, but let's test the model of this. And so I worked with him and his staff over the summer, pulled in some other people around the state who work on these issues to try to inform um, you know, how a pilot could roll out. We told him he identified uh, Senator Hansen, who headed up the key uh, school aid committees, because 10 cents is in the school aid budget, um, rather than the ag budget. Even though Senator Brewer sat on the ag committee, national school lunch dollars go through the Department of Education. And he also thought that he would have a good champion there, and he was right. And so, um, you know, when I think about that story of getting those emails and texts floating out into the ether around me, it just, you know, reminds me so much. It's like that was the beginning of what has now become a statewide program. Um, well, it's a program adopted by the state. It's been available in five regions of the state. And again, if we get that budget coming up, the Senate and the House have now talked about increasing it from $575,000 last year to $2 million in the coming year and making it available to school districts for grants um, across the state and also to early child care centers. So we're pretty excited about that. And um, that will be its fourth year. So we've had three years of steady growth. Um, so today, you know, I want to um, talk a little bit about that. Um, our messaging has been that it's sparking healthy choices for kids and a vibrant economy. And um, as Annie said, you know, or maybe it was Angela, it's win-win, you know? We have multiple stakeholders. It, can, it appeals to people who are into agriculture and economy. It appeals to people who like um, kids and health, you know? And hopefully, a lot of times you find that they're the same people, but at least it's bringing a lot of different people to the table. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about engagement and how we got there, and that's a big topic. I'm going to narrow it to two key areas. One is sort of what that engagement has looked like for us, and then some of the impacts of how that has played out. 
So um, in terms of uh, what it's looked like, there's really two elements, two key messaging um, elements and two uh, key strategies. So on the messaging, we have been working with people around the state, whether it's with community groups or it's been through networks, like there's a lot of um, uh, local food networks around the, the um, state and health-oriented networks around the state to first just raise awareness that this program even exists. Because, um, as Annie said, you know, you need to continually educate legislators about these programs. Ten cents a meal is one teeny tiny line item in a huge school aid budget, which is one part of the much larger full state budget. And so we have found that any legislator who learns about this, they love it. Um, but they didn't know about it necessarily before, even though they may have voted to support it technically. And so, um, so we want people to know that it exists, not just legislators, but people around the state. Because at some point, you know, when we keep getting all of this changeover, we want enough people in the state to know that it exists, so that if it's gonna get cut in the future, that people will say, hey, we love this program. You know, this is important to this. This is part of Michigan's identity. So that's one of the things that we're, uh, our message is. The other message that we have is less about actually um, reaching out, educating people in your community so that they can then educate their legislators, but it's also about being supportive of your schools because this is an amazing opportunity to have money from our own state's uh, general fund go toward investing in kids and autonomy. And we need to help schools be able to really utilize it well. It's a real opportunity. You may have people in your community who don't actually feel comfortable talking to a legislator, but they might be a master gardener who really wants to help with the school garden, which is going to get kids interested in eating, say, kale, like you heard Dr. Mm -hmm. Rivard talk about last night. Because they grew it, they're going to be more likely to take it in a salad bar. I've got tons of stories to bear that out. And so there's, uh, so that's the twofold message. Make sure people in your community and your legislators know that the program exists, and then also work to find ways to help your schools be successful. So, and then um, talking about those sort of two strategies, um, one of the things that uh, I've done is work with a coalition called Healthy Kids Healthy Michigan. They're based in the Lansing area. They have a lobbyist that they contract with. They've decided, oh boy, they've decided to make um, uh, 10 cents a top priority. And so they're in Lansing. They know how to work at talking to legislators, key legislators, as Annie said. And so then I will talk to the legislators that they find to just educate them about the nuts and bolts, but then link them to others in the community. Um, around the state that they may be interested in. And that has happened now um, in Flint, in Battle Creek, in Kalamazoo, in Detroit, where we've been working and creating ambassadors in those communities. They know about it. They know how to help their schools be supportive. So I just sort of set the table for legislative staff talking about the details. And then they can actually um, talk to their constituents, which is who they really care about. We also, you may notice, we've got a Get Involved uh, tab up there. And that Get Involved is a place where you can sign on as a supporter. And I just like to say that everybody's voice is so important. If there are health care providers in the room, your voices really matter. I think you heard Oren say that last night. Um, your voices are influential. You can be influential um, with legislators, with your community, and also um, in supporting your schools. So um, I think I'm probably about at time, so I'm going to skip a couple of things, and maybe I'll talk about them a little later. But I just did want to say, in terms of um, you know what working on this has meant to me, is seeing how you can start small in your own community. Plan it out so that you are actually thinking about inspiring the legislature to move policy. Um, collect data. Data helps you to tell stories, and those stories are going to move people. And we can have messaging, we can have strategies, 
But what it really comes down to, if I think back to those texts and emails fluttering up, is relationship. And I think you've heard me talk about different relationships with people in your own community, with key legislators, and with influential stakeholders around the state. And so everyone bringing those voices to the table, that's really sort of the, the water, the sun, and the air that really helps all of this to grow. All right. Advance the slide and do a little introduction for Michelle. So Michelle Jacobs is with the Manistee County Conservation District and is working as the, make sure I get the title right, Produce Safety Technician. Correct. All right. Yeah. For the for FISMA, which is the Food Safety Modernization Act, but here in Michigan it is the Michigan Farm Produce Safety Program. Is that correct? Michigan on Farm Produce Safety Okay, so program. a yes. different type of policy, yeah. but give us your kind of take on evidence. Yeah, so I guess I kind of wanted to gauge the audience first and see who is familiar with the Food Safety Modernization Act Produce Safety Rule. Okay, that helps me gauge what I'm going to say a little bit more. Um, okay, so my name is Michelle Jacobs. I'm the Produce Safety Technician with the Manistee Conservation District. Um, I cover five counties. I cover Manistee, Benzie, Grand Traverse, Leelanau, and Antrim counties. And my main role is to help farmers implement produce safety practices on their farm in relation to the Food Safety Modernization Act produce safety rule. Um, so I'm kind of the other side of policy. Uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act produce safety rule was finalized in 2015. Um, President Obama actually put this rule into place and um, after a response to the spinach outbreak, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the spinach outbreak in 2006, um, I can't remember the exact numbers, but a lot of people fell ill and actually died from the spinach outbreak. So this was President Obama's response to that. Um, the Food Safety Modernization Act Produce Safety Rule focuses on the growing, harvesting, packing, and holding of fresh produce on the farm. Um, fresh produce being raw agricultural commodities, so raw products that we typically consume raw. So um, the way that was distinguished was actually through a survey. Um, so there are raw agricultural <laughs> commodities and then there are rarely consumed raw commodities. So there are certain things that are on the farm that are not covered by this rule, typically because they have a kill step. So you're cooking it, you're brining it, fermenting it, whatever it is that has that kill step to eliminate that bacteria or other type of contaminants that can people can get sick from. Um, so my, sorry I trailed off there, I hope that kind of gives a good background of the Food Safety Modernization Act and what that is. Um, there are multiple parts of the Food Safety Modernization Act. There are packing house, there's HACCP, which is a hazard analysis critical control point, and that's basically for pack houses that are dealing with fresh produce or other commodities. Um, my role is to offer on-farm assistance. So I'm getting out directly on the farm to help growers figure out, one, how they fit within the rule. Um, so there are different exemptions under the rule, um, specifically relating to uh, what your annual income is, um, your average annual food sales, um, and then what products you're growing and what retail outlets you're selling to. So there are different exemptions that a grower can meet, and then if they're processing or if they're sending it to a processor that is using a kill step to eliminate those potential contaminants on the farm. Um, so what I do is go on the farm and deliver these different risk assessments. We have multiple risk assessments that we use in the state. The Michigan On Farm Produce Safety Program actually isn't a regulation itself. Um, this actually was developed in response to the rule, and Michigan is the only state that is doing this right now and that has the technicians in the state. So there's six of us throughout the state. We cover 37 counties. Um, our main goal is to get out on that farm and educate and provide that technical assistance for farmers to make these adjustments to fit into the highest produce safety standards. Um, the Michigan On Farm Produce Safety Program is, itself is, we're, because we're the only state that's doing it, um, this was Michigan's response to offering the assistance to growers and kind of dealing with the rule and how to implement these practices on the farm. Um, so we have multiple resources that we use and also assessments that we use for farm-specific practices. So the Michigan On Farm Produce Safety Risk Assessment is tailored to like smaller scale growers that might not have food safety um, on their farm already, or they're doing it, they just don't have it documented 
there are certain processes they could still implement on their farm, so we go through a risk assessment to address that. Um, and then we go through a process of helping them develop a food safety plan, um, and then they can earn a certificate at, once they've completed it to say they've been through this program. So this is for those small-scale growers that might not be able to afford like group GAP or GAP or Primus, which GAP is an uh, auditing program, which a lot of the time is um, a buyer will require GAP to make sure that um, farms are following certain produce safe or safety practices on their farm. Um, we also have the on-farm readiness review, which is a nationwide program that was developed by extension agents. Um, this program is tailored to those larger scale growers that might have GAP or Primus or something that a uh, food auditing program in place already on their farm. Um, this process is administered by, in our state, by Tex in the state, um, MSU Extension, and then often MDARD will tag along, and that's another on-farm assessment that we go to these farms and do a direct assessment and analyze the different parts of the rule on their farm and um, give them suggestions on how to improve. Uh, we also help in developing the produce safety plans for which breaks down your documenting your processes on the farm essentially and breaking it down in the growing, harvesting, packing, and holding up produce on your farm. Um, let's see. All that the techs do, they housed us under the conservation districts um, as a part of a way to be free, voluntary, and confidential. So our services are completely free. Our positions are funded through the state. Um, MDAR funds our positions are grant funded through the state. Um, and then we are housed under the conservation districts and we're a free resource to all farmers. So small scale, mid scale, large scale, all growers can access our, us as a resource. Um, let's see, what am I missing? Most of what I do is on the farm. So really right now in the state, us techs are trying to just get the word out that we are free resource to growers. Um, there's, there's a lot of fear surrounding the Food Safety Modernization Act Produce Safety Rule and being able to have us as a free resource to growers, I think in Michigan is a really great thing that Michigan did to kind of alleviate that fear a little bit. Um, a lot of the times some growers think we're regulators or inspectors, which we're trying to make sure that they know this is an educational and free visit that we can help assist them. Um, in being compliant with the rule or just implementing produce safety on their farm. Um, and also providing that technical assistance to demonstrate different ways that are cost effective to them and making sure that it's farm specific. So whatever commodities they're growing, um, we can help tailor different practices to that. Um, there are higher risk crops, depending on how uh, you see it, um, like lettuces, tomatoes, melons, those are higher risk crops, so how you're handling those on your farm compared to those crops that aren't covered, like potatoes and other things. Um, so, let's see. I think one of the big things for Michigan is a lot of the techs that have been in this position a little bit longer than I have, um, especially in Southwest Michigan, which is a highly uh, a, a farmland area in the state. Um, is that a lot of the growers who have used the program have kind of dissolved that fear of FISMA and they're like, okay, we're going to be okay. This isn't just another regulation that might put us under. Um, just dissolving that fear and really getting those practices implemented. I think another thing is a lot of farms realize like we already have a lot of these processes in place. Let's document it. Let's just make sure we have it written so when, if we do get inspected, then we're all set. Um, Okay, cool. <laughs> um, let's see. Let me see some stuff. Uh, oh, depending on the scale of the farm, so uh, inspections have started it this year for large scale farms. So that's those 500,000 and over um, covered produce farms. Um, they're a little late on inspections. They were supposed to start in 2018, but these compliance dates have been pushed back because there is so much. Um, education that had to be done prior to inspections um, and just getting those inspectors ready on what they're looking for on the farm as well. Um, that'll move down the line so we'll move to small, what they, there's large scale farms, small, and then extra small, there's no medium. <laughs> so, and that's, and it's actually not so much dependent on acres, it's actual annual food sales. So that's how they define these 
large, small, extra small, very small farms. And then also one big key component to the rule um, in the process of growing, harvesting, packing, and molding is the usage of water. So they're really focused on water testing. There's separate water testing compliant states where growers are having to test for generic E. coli. Um, depending on what they're using it for, so if it's in production or post-production water, um, if, where they're sourcing their water from, if it's surface water or well water, surface waters like your lake streams, ponds, etc., cetera, um, they're having to test for this generic E. coli because that's where a lot of our outbreaks have stemmed from. Um, yeah, but that's kind of a brief overview of, um, in a nutshell, of the rule. We could talk about the rule for weeds probably and <laughs> still not fully understand it, but yeah, I'm happy to talk about it further with the extra questions we have next. So, all right, thanks for the overviews. Mm -hmm. Now what we really have is a chance for a lot of different, a lot of dialogue, but I wanted to kind of start with because there's the count, they're all interesting programs, very different policy programs, all connected to food. Um, but they're, I guess I would say, depending on where you, they're all a little bit obscure. They're all parts of the food system that the average citizen maybe isn't really that aware of. And I know, like from Double Up Food Bucks, and also Ten Cents a Meal, your job is absolutely to get people to be aware um, as much as possible, although there's a lot, of, a lot about um, funding, right? It's about making sure you have funding for your program. So I wondered if each of you could just kind of go back through and talk a little about what you enjoy about policy and what, what drew you to policy work in particular. Because it is a little below the radar. Um, so Annie and I are kind of on not exactly opposite ends, but um, Annie focusing really on the policy um, and helping bring in some of that funding, and I'm the outreach and engagement manager, I'm very um, customer focused, and um, I you know, was, have always been interested, well, been like working with her at least, interested in, in food access and assistance, um, growing up on food stamps. Um, I've never really been politically active, but um, came into working in um, food through, through food core um, and nutrition and garden education. Um, and I've really gotten more into the policy and um, working with Annie um, and our program um, to, to really make sustainable change. Um, so I get to talk to a lot of people, a lot of um, Double Up Food Bucks customers, and um, gather a lot of stories um, that just kind of help fuel, fuel that work, fuel our work and my own personal passion. So kind of the opposite of that, I've been politically active for as long as I can remember. I went to my first protest alone when I was 13. I've been to many before that um, with my parents. And, um, so I've, I've been engaged in the political process. I used to write the governor of Minnesota, which is I'm from Minneapolis, and it's Tim Pawlenty. I wrote him all the time. Um, never heard that, but it's OK. <laughs> engaged for a really long time, um, and I was living in D.C. and doing advocacy work um, in uh, like health-related fields, just not food work. And what I realized was that um, lots of folks were advocating for political change. It just wasn't the folks that were directly impacted by the policies being passed, and it usually was the lobbyists, and that the political process is set up in a way that there can be true systemic change made in the political process, but it's also set up in a way that excludes very intentionally the people directed, directly impacted by policies, um, people who are low income, communities of color from the political process. And so to me, I think that why I'm drawn to policy is because it really does have the opportunity to make change. There's true systemic change can come through the political system if we actually step up and start engaging in it. And by that I mean folks have been engaging it for years that have been pushed aside and like their voices haven't have been excluded or not listened to. So trying to find ways to make sure that the folks on the ground in communities who've been doing amazing, amazing advocacy work are have the ability and are uplifted in the political process so that their voices can be heard so that true system of change can happen. And this is actually the first policy initiative I've ever worked on. So this has been real learning experience for me. 
My background is as a newspaper reporter. Um, I've been at Groundwork Center for 15 years now, but prior to that, I was in journalism for decades. And, um, and so my role now in this, before I was doing more on the ground farm to school work in our region, but now I'm a statewide partner working with Michigan Department of Education on communications about 10 cents a meal, um, but also working on outreach around the state, um, separate from that. And uh, so it's been interesting to me to think through like, okay, we have our legislative report, it's growing and growing around the state. And so trying to think through, okay, who are the legislators where we have schools that are grantees and making sure that these voices get heard so that the legislators know what kind of impact this has had for them. So I can still use my communications capacity and think about, well, what is the real story here and what is the data really and truly showing us about the impacts and what are the quotes that, that illustrate the impact that this has had for our schools and our kids and our farms. Um, but also to think about it strategically about, well, who is the audience? And so I've um, been working on ways to make it something that legislators will see their communities here, people within the communities will see themselves here and can share it back out within their own communities. So it's been interesting for me to think about it from that communications perspective. Um, it's also been, um, you know, sort of a, a interesting thing to think through to get to know different senators and different legislators to realize how important those relationships really are. Um, there's a person statewide who does a lot of work um, in helping people understand how to uh, talk to legislators to educate them. Her name is Jean Doss. And she talks about the importance of when you have legislators in your community, that you just get to know them. You don't have a specific ask. You're just there getting to know them so that they know you and they know the things that are important to you. And then when an opportunity comes up to move something, they already know you and they want to know what you think. And you have a door open to share some additional information with them. So that's been something that's been um, something new that I've learned and that I've really appreciated learning. My turn? Yeah. I forgot to mention, um, this is Kevin Bruce-Snyder, he's uh, gaining permission to say this, so my confidentiality is moot at this point, but this is Kevin Bruce-Snyder, he went through the Michigan Mountain Farms Program Safety and Risk Assessment and completed it. He's a really small scale orchard in Lima, Montana, he's not covered by the role. Um, so it just goes to show kind of the scope of our program, it's just not, it's not just reaching those large scale growers, but kind of all different scales of growers. And, just just wanted to give him a little highlight and thank you for letting me use this um i guess i come in from a different angle of policy um i actually my background is in food industry management and sustainable ag and food systems um i studied the agri food chain in school um, and the whole processes and really production design is what really interested me in all of it um which stemmed into me working on farms outside of school mostly organic farms um, and just seeing the processes and practices that were implemented <coughs> from, from a sustainable aspect. But really, for me, this is an interesting take. I never thought I'd go into food safety. Um, so being able to implement policy in this aspect has been really interesting. Uh, and just being able to provide that resource to growers, um, I feel is really important, um, especially in implementing something that is mandatory for them. Um, and kind of the the whole scope of farming as a whole, especially in northern Michigan this year, has been really challenging for growers. So being able to look at it, okay, these growers are facing many different challenges. How can we provide them resources um, to successfully continue to farm? Um, whether that's um, regenerative practices um, with changing climate, um, those different struggles they face with the climate, um, having access to land um, and continuing to farm, or whether it's implementing food safety on the farm. So just those different aspects of providing these resources to growers in such a 
challenging field um, has been really important to me. All right. Maybe we should see are there are there any specific questions right now from the from those of you out there? Mm -hmm. All right. So my interest is in food insecurity and the fact that the food coalition. So we are looking at providing healthy food to people who are food insecure. And when I hear about advocacy efforts, it seems like you've gone with a, a specific program. So right, double up food bucks, and that one that helps food insecure people. Well, Ten cents a meal also helps food insecure people. Mm -hmm. um, aggregately, though, uh, there's probably a lot of programs. And the whole, you know, the whole there's a package available to people who are food insecure. But it seems like the legislation is in these lanes that are mm -hmm. different attacks at the prop the issue. Mm -hmm. Is that sort of true, the norm, or is there sort of a, an advocacy effort in general that looks at the whole issue? Andy touched on it a little bit, and kind of speaking as someone that like, doesn't have as much policy experience, there's uh, Policy makers are just so overwhelmed with so much information that if you can present like a program, you know that's pretty logical and like and easy to understand. Um, that's way easier to advocate for than just you know food security, which is such a nebulous issue. Um, like what does that look like? I think it's a both and for sure. Mm -hmm. and Diane talked a bit about how it's helping Michigan, but there's some other statewide coalitions and more regional coalitions within a state that are looking at um, specific policy priorities. I would say the, the issue is, is that I actually, something that's been interesting as a more recent Michigander is that I, I haven't really seen policy coalitions that are based on like large issues of food insecurity or it seems like everything is very um, line item budget driven. Um, which both of us have talked about, right? We, we both are benefiting from line item in the budget, in theory. And um, and I think that that's, like Angela saying, you have to have an ask for a politician, but I, I still think that there, I, I'm, I've been a little surprised at, at how, in a lot of ways, the advocacy seems sometimes a little flip, like nascent. And that just might be like the spaces that I'm in in, Ar in Ann Arbor. I, I don't really know, but but it doesn't seem like there have been so many movements always to make broader coalition. Yeah. Um, again, as I say, this is my first time working on a policy issue, but we have been. It's it is like one specific ask, but we're trying to. Uh, find those multiple stakeholders who have different reasons to be interested in it. And as we keep building, the fact that we have these two very successful initiatives that are about food insecurity, really, um, I mean, a lot of people are looking at what Michigan is doing as a result of some of these things going on. And I almost feel like like Michigan Farm Bureau has now come on in support of 10 cents a meal. Mm -hmm. um, Michigan Farmers Union has. The School Nutrition Association of Michigan, um, a lot of different healthcare providers. I forgot to say on that Get Involved tag is that you can go there and you can sign your name up. And we're looking to create um, a statewide message that uh, part of Michigan's identity is that we invest in local food for our kids. And um, the, we've also, uh, in our strategy, felt like we here in Traverse City can't be everywhere in the state. And so we are uh, working with people in different parts of the state. So like in Detroit, with the Detroit Food Policy Council people, who then have been reaching out in their own communities with some of these materials that we strategize about, well, what materials would be helpful for spreading the word there? Um, and that resulted, Winona Bynum, who is the uh, executive director of Detroit Food Policy Council, spoke to a big coalition in the Detroit area that's concerned about childhood obesity and health. 
Sitting in the audience was the policy director of the um, Michigan Academy of Dietetics and Nutrition and Dietetics, and they were going to be going to Lansing soon to talk about their main talking points. And so you saw this ripple effect. That ended up being that there was a legislator from Detroit who actually was so impressed hearing about it from the dietitians that he immediately texted Detroit Public Schools and Hamtramck Schools that he represented to find out what they thought about it. And they did know about it and they did want it. And it was partly because they were, they were learning about it from people in their community. So I guess my point is that there's this ripple effect. That legislature held a rally with chants and all kinds of things, wanting to get 10 cents in the all to the Detroit area. But it may not be that there's this overarching policy that takes in every single thing, but I think behind the scenes, you know, we are all needing each other. And the more that spreads out, the more we're working together and sort of maybe the, the sum of the parts is greater than the whole, that we are putting together pieces, but at least we're aware of each other and we collaborate. I would add one more thing too, that Governor Granholm did create a, like a food policy council that sat in her purview and it was removed in 2015, I believe, from Governor Snyder. And that was a way for folks to come together in like all the different parts at least have a way to speak within the government um, and that has been disbanded. So there's also like some intentionality behind it too, right? That there's, it was created, people can argue how effective or defunct it kind of existed, but it no longer exists, right? And so things like that, in theory, Governor Whitmer has talked about that she's gonna create a, a person dedicated to food insecurity. So I think the person said it would be like food security director, from what I've heard. Um, and will sit in her office, like as an executive level. But that person doesn't exist yet. Um, I think there's like some rumors that that person's gonna exist soon, right? But things like that, like the, there has to also be some institutionalization. And I think um, people turn over so fast and things change so fast in this state that it's hard sometimes to keep that institutionalization, but also just a reminder to like, but there can be pressure on governor's offices to, to reinstall and to, or to, re, to make sure that Whitmer actually does establish this director. And so things like that, there's, there has been movement, there is movement by this governor, so we just, we just have to keep an eye out. Mm -hmm. So I have a question I kind of want to insert here, mainly for Tom, Diane, and Andy, because it's, it's an interesting opportunity. You're both working on programs that are seeking funding in the governor's budget. Um, I know you're both aware of each other's programs and supporting them. What are some of the similarities in your strategies? And what are you like observing about each other's work that, you're, that you think is interesting since you're both sitting here and you get to talk about each other? Kind of, I'd be interested because I know you're both in the same world, but working on different policies. Not put you on the spot. Put you on the spot. Talk about each other's work. It's a good question. I was actually sharing with Dan yesterday that something that I found to be really interesting when I go to talk with legislators or their staff is that often they ask, "Well, why do we need both ten cents and double yeah. up?" And it actually is instead of it being like a like a feeling of plenty, it's a feeling of they they sometimes present a feeling of scarcity, right? And mm -hmm. um, for those of you who don't know, the, the legislators put on, they chose to put targets on this budget. So they have things that they were, they mandated of themselves to cut certain percentages out of each budget um, that the caucus chose, right? It, no one else mandated it of them. Um, and so it was constantly a thing of, of, well, why do we need both of these programs? And the, the, the thing that I found really amazing about it was that I usually hadn't mentioned 10 cents yet in my conversation, and the legislators knew about 10 cents. Mm -hmm. The thing that I found really discouraging is that they thought that they had to be mutually exclusive and mm -hmm. that they should only fund one, mm -hmm. right? That to them it was either the two million for 10 cents or the million for double up, but first of all, they're not in the same budget. Mm -hmm. 
right? It's schooly under the Department of Education and then the Department of Agriculture. But um, I think it's been amazing to me to watch for me to watch how statewide ten cents has become with, with legislators in places that haven't had a ten cents. I guess it's not a pilot anymore, but a ten cents program in their districts have known about it. But yet that they still act out of such a place of scarcity um, in terms of thinking that we do have sufficient local food program and why would they fund two the two programs out of the budget of three million dollars in total out of the 40 billion dollars <laughs> um, <laughs> right yeah literally like it's a drop in the bucket um so it's it's been interesting i think um the thing that i personally have found most exciting and um, watching the 10 cents campaign is, um, and, and you spoke about it, Representative Robinson's rally and other rallies and kind of grassroots engagement. I mean, that's what I am, a, like, got my master's degree in, like, grassroots policy advocacy. Um, it's what I, like, drew me to advocacy. So it's been really fun to watch. It's been fun to watch, like, the ability to, to host rallies about local food. That's awesome. I've, I've never been to rally about local food, I've been to a lot of rallies. <laughs> so um, I think that's been personally really, really meaningful to me. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, we, uh, the whole reason that we did a pilot project in our region um, is we took lessons from Oregon, which had tried to get um, it's legislature to have a program like this. Advocates such as us had talked to them and they said, mm, nah. And so then they went and they tested it out and did a pilot and then the Oregon legislature said, oh yeah, okay, that's impressive. And I have learned from Fair Food Network in the same way. They were very strategic. Um, Annie hasn't talked about what they've also done at the federal level, but working with Senator Stabenow and working strategically on other key states around the country where they could have double up um, incentive programs. Again, where those key legislators who sit on ag committees who would be deciding on the budget could see the impact of it. Um, so that's something that I've really learned from you all is that strategic thinking. Um, because it, we want that for everybody. You know, we want it to be everywhere in the country or everywhere in the state. But learning that it is, as Annie has said, and she's in Lansing more knows that nitty gritty more than I do. But um, you know, all of all of those line items and all of the things that the legislators have to learn, um, you really need to. We're, we're doing this broader grassroots advocacy, but we're also trying to hone in to see, okay, who are the decision makers? And making sure that those people for sure know um, what's going on about it. And so it is, for the first three years, it's been called a pilot project at the state level. And if this budget passes um, early next week, then um, they've crossed out the word pilot project and they're calling it a program now. So, um, so that's my blame there. And I actually need to say that in terms of uh, Food Safety Modernization Act, our food, we have a food and farming network, which is our region's uh, local food council. And nobody was really prepared. Nobody nationally at all was prepared for the Food Safety Modernization Act, who works in local food systems and sustainable ag circles. But it was so huge. There was a lot of fear among smaller farmers and those of us who are really working to have that be a part of the, the palette of options for farmers, you know, to be able to have those smaller growers, to not have all of this work that has been done to connect people fall by the wayside because of rules that in some cases might be outsized in terms of the requirements uh, to meet food safety. Not that you can't have problems on a small farm level, but the measures needed, you know, do you need this big a sink or maybe this big a sink will work as well, you know, kind of a thing. Um, and so we took the time, as did people across the state, to put in comments about that to point out the ways in which this was, um, had some potential to have some unintended consequences. 
And it's been great for me to see that Michigan now has this program to try to take it and make sure that it is explained well to everyone. Michelle spends most of her time talking to farmers, but she's here talking to all of us today. So she's making all of us aware of this so that we can also be more articulate about this. And also, you know, for me working with schools, the school systems can have a better sense if they have concerns about food safety. There's people that they can go to also. So it's great for me, and I've worked also closely with Michigan Department of Education now on implement, actually implementing the 10 cents program. And to know sort of the behind the scenes things that are going on in order to really carry it out um, has been you know, a great boon. And it's another thing I'd suggest if you want to work on any particular policy to get to know the people in the agency who will carry it out because they will have great insights on it and, and uh, can be your greatest allies if they're engaged. But it's been really positive for me to see this implementation aspect of it also. Yeah, and I guess for me to note just to like these programs as we're working to increase access for everyone um, as an inherent human right, let's make sure that food is safe. Like, let's get these kids fresh, nutritious food and make sure it's safe too, because what good is it if it's not safe? So, it's kind of how this program indirectly relates to the schools. And ways that, again, on the, I'm sorry. Ways on the background that it's worked too, that's the idea that if we know each other, we're linking things. When Double Up Food Bucks first came out, um, food service directors in our region, we provided flyers to them. They were sending flyers home to schools so that those families that would be high for any use lunch would also know about this other opportunity. So there's a way to do that embrace around children and families that way. I have a question. I'm a healthcare provider, mm -hmm. uh, integrative medicine practitioner, mm -hmm. um, and I'm I'm so excited to know that what I say matters. I hear that, mm -hmm. and then my question is how how can I get connected? I have a lot of sort of obstacles to like if I call somebody and then I'm in the room with the patient and they call back. That's just a simple issue that I deal with a lot. Um, I work for a nonprofit that educates kids about nutrition too, part time. So I'd like to get involved in policy, and I and I feel like um, excited about it. But I I'd like to find a mentor, or like how do other healthcare providers do this? Because I'm just like you know I'm, I'm not going to stop seeing patients. I can't just like go into an office and be a policy guy. Because I want to do what I do, but I'd like to also help with boss. So I don't. I'm just asking maybe some ideas about how I might do that. Yeah, that seems like it could be around the room, right? Yeah. yeah, I have a few That's ideas, but I'd love to hear what everyone else has to say. And like maybe folks in the room also have ideas. But I have been um, both on the Hill in DC in Congress and in Lansing when there have been advocacy days for doctors. Um, and they come in their white coats. And it is, I have never seen either Lansing legislators or members of Congress listen more closely than when people in their white coats show up. Except maybe if it's like co-brothers. Well, um, yeah, a lot of the <laughs> things that my political action committee for the statewide association advocate for, I, I don't believe in at all. I mean, yeah. they're, they're advocating for turf and things that I don't care about. Right. right. So I think that the, that there, the associations are definitely going a lot and like folks are going up in the white coats. Um, and then the other thing is, is like Diane was mentioning, um, your legislators always hold coffee hours. Both your members of Congress and your state legislators um, by coffee hours, I mean most of them are actually like involved alcohol, has been my experience. Um, and they're almost always monthly, um, even members of Congress, although sometimes those can be bi-monthly, and show up to those. Because I, I'm from Ann Arbor, um, I live in Ipsy now, but I lived in Ann Arbor for four years, and um, our state rep, I went to his pizza hour um, for like four months straight, and there were like three of us. 
Mm-hmm. You know, and like he has my cell phone number. He always knows when I come. He's like, oh, there are three things you probably want to talk about today. Which of the three is today? You know, like he, no one shows up. And so if you show up, first of all, they need help too often, but also they can be great mentors. But also, no one is showing up. Like they have those hours. And do they do they identify them as like for healthcare issues or no? Or I just just I have office hours. I'm available. You can come and talk to me. But truthfully, I went in June to op- and it was like office hours, and someone was talking about like the roads and parking issues in FC, and I was like, I would like to talk about abortion, and that was we just like ran the gamut. It was like mm-hmm. we talked about roads and parking, and then I was like. <laughs> They're going to talk about abortion, and someone else would be talking about something else. I don't remember what the other thing was. Right? So, like, it is whatever, whatever, like, the, that was me as just a citizen, not me and my job, by the way. This is like a clarifying point. Um, <laughs> um, right? So, like, there's no healthcare specific one, but there are so few people there that they'll talk about whatever you want to talk about. Okay. Mm-hmm. If, if I could do a quick, because, um, uh, we also want to get like the word out through healthcare providers to, to customers or um, potential users of our program. Um, I, I didn't mention this when I explained it, but we and I'll talk about it in our next session. But we do distribute out flyers. Like if you wanted to have some double up flyers to give to your patients, um, I'll, I'll have cards too if anyone wants that. You can get in touch with me. Any other responses or thoughts to that? Because that was a Really good question. Yeah, Charlie. Yeah, one thing that um, I've been thinking the last five, ten minutes is just the notion that we, all of us in our work, have audiences. And when when you were talking about, you know, what, what strategically, what can we do to network better, maybe, or to get to those audiences? One of the things that I've, and I just happened across this. I publish uh, Edible Grand Traverse, and in our office. We have a table outside where we have magazines of back issues. And now, whenever I run across any information on a program that I find interesting that's food related or even other policy related, I think to do with water, you name it, I'll, I'll put it out on the same table that has our, our back issues. And so, what's happening is people who are interested in the magazine who drop by and pick up past issues also may see something on Double Up Food Box or. Um, or something related. So that's sort of a, and, and it, it also reinforces to me something that I strongly believe in, having observed it in myself, which is many of us respond much better to opt in situations um, where, you know, we're taken with, we see, you know, we see color, we see a photograph that looks, I mean, we have covers on our magazine that have to do with food. So this is something that we, people get titillated when they see things that appeal to them. And that's true of all of us, that we have curiosity. And so just the idea of allowing things to flow and people to pick things up voluntarily of their own accord, um, it, it gets after, there, there's a great, um, there's an incredibly important polity that's outside of all of what we're talking about, which is um, voters and taxpayers, and a lot of them are the same people. But the work you guys are doing, I mean, I feel like standing up and like, rah, rah, cheer, cheer, because it's all so fabulous. And yet we know that people get busy and they don't know when they go into their booth and vote or when they you know, send in their check to the IRS or the state for taxes, they don't necessarily identify with programs that are in many cases publicly funded. And, and I think that's really, it's interesting that it's budget driven because you know, theoretically government, these are things we share in common, these are values we share. Not uniformly, but that's why we live in a democracy, right? Um, and, and so I'd really like to see what, whatever all of us can do to try to spread this out and, and just allow people to happen across something that broadens their view of what's possible. Because um, it's a lot more about the possible. These things work. I mean, what I'm listening to is success, 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 success. They're all working. And so it's really a question of propagating and expanding and, and getting people behind it who aren't even aware of it. I mean, the, the good news is once they're aware, they're probably going to check that box and get behind it. So that's, um, that's something that's outside of the immediate policy and funding and the idea of fighting every year for, for funding, which 
you know, it would be really nice if you walked in and you had a great big budget and you knew you could double what you're doing every year for 10 years. That would be, you know, an ideal world. And, but that does rely, I think, on voters and taxpayers and getting the word out. So anyway, I'll stop. I promise. Yeah, you could question. I have a question, so. Yeah, oh. responding to this comment? Yeah, so just kind of a spin-off. So I work with the Michigan Farmers Market Association. I'm a big partner of Fair Food Network, and we operate um, the Double Up Food Butt program in several of our, or so many of the markets. Um, and I was lucky enough that with the um, new Congress that came in, my district representative was both on the um, Health Committee and on the Agriculture Committee. And so I took it upon myself to schedule a meeting with her, first as an individual. And then the governor's budget came out. So I got to use my chance with her just to mention the program. And then that was hopefully to encourage her, if she ever had questions in the future, to come back and reference to me. You know, so that it, it was a chance for her to have someone in her district who knew the programs and then not be just reliant on the papers coming in front of her, the hearsay that she's hearing. So, I mean, it's, it, it's all of us working together to move the programs forward. Yeah. I'd just like to echo that idea of, again, being a, a former newspaper reporter. I can't tell you how many rural township meetings I've gone to where there were two or three people who would show up. And it's often the same people every single month. And those people had influence just because they showed up. It wasn't necessarily some quote unquote good old boy, you know, who was coming and ramming something through, although I certainly saw that too. But it also would just be people who took civic engagement seriously and showed up and were thoughtful and would sometimes say, you know, that doesn't seem quite right. What about this? And, you know, if there's five people on the board and three people in the audience, it's like, oh yeah, and you really have this conversation. So just that idea of having the conversation. Um, for 10 cents a meal, if you sign up as a supporter, you can sign up with your name and if you're uh, whatever kind of healthcare provider you may be. If you happen to be associated with an entity, let's say the American Medical Association, that you're on their board or whatever, you can get them to pass something. Um, and uh, Munson Healthcare has come on, is listed as a supporter of 10 cents a meal. So getting those names there to show, and then someone like myself is doing communications, at times I might write something, and I'll know there are X number of people in the healthcare field who have signed up, and there's X numbers in, in the education field, and X numbers in farming field, and it provides, again, that sort of broader uh, narrative of what the support is there. And then we also have, you know, alerts that we'll send out um, when it's an important time to just write to your legislator and you can take that information, but it's always best to personalize it. And so, you know, I'm a healthcare provider. I've seen, I've provided um, fact sheets about double up food bucks in my waiting room because I know that I have people who are food insecure and those things are, they're, you know, every month I have to resupply it because it is of such value. To be able to say something personal like that, yeah. um, I think is really compelling. And then, depending on your relationships with people you're caring for, you know, if they're telling you thank you so much for letting me know about this double up food box problem that's made such a difference in my life, you know, at some point you could say, well, you know, this is coming before the legislature again. You know, your voice would be important also to be heard here's what I'm saying, I'm writing, you might want to write and say that you're a person who's personally benefited from it because that means so much, that kind of thing. Yeah. I think this, I'll just maybe say it's the obvious a couple more things, which one is show up at conferences like this and you not only hear about these opportunities, but you get to meet folks. You know, I work at a nonprofit, I work with Diane, and she's pretty accessible and she's extremely knowledgeable. And I know it would be the same with Annie and Angela and, you know, Getting to know your nonprofit or, um, advocacy organization, somebody that's essentially paid to work in the issues that you're interested in, they're, they're, they'll find time to take you when you're picking up working with patients. You know, they'll get to know you 
also, um, you know, I think Andy's point about getting to know your, your legislators are, is really important. Also, sometimes get to know their staff, mm -hmm. because that can be really helpful. You know, they'll call you back more frequently. That's a relationship that can be really, really helpful as well. So yeah, you know. Uh, well, it's kind of going off that idea that so the coffee meetings, there's not a lot of people. The meetings you've been to, there hasn't been a lot of people. I and I don't have a ton of experience, um, nor know people that do. But I personally feel like maybe there's always been this almost negative, intense, scary feeling with government and legislation and policy. Um, and, and a lot of times that comes from you know fear of the unknown. None of us have done that work. And once you get there, it probably breaks barriers. So my curiosity is, I'd love to hear from each of you guys, what is like, what do you find really awesome about working with local government? Or like, what, what maybe what's a story of a fear you had, but you went in and like faced it, broke past that barrier, had an amazing conversation you didn't expect? Or is there anything that you can share that can help us maybe who don't know anyone working on it? Seems, seems intimidating, right? But really, you just have to go. Do you have any um, stories or suggestions? I guess I could start. Um, just as a general, broad, working with growers, most of the time, me coming in and being like, I'm a resource for you for this regulation, they're pissed. Like, a lot of growers are mad about it. They're like, I'm already doing these practices. Why, why are you here? Why is this your role? Are you a regulator? Are you an inspector? Who are you? Why do I need you? So just being able to kind of like come in, explain to them, give them some sort of information that kind of changes their mind like yeah i'm still a little mad about this but i understand why it's in place and i i want to be safe and that's always the response is i'm mad about it i want to be safe no matter what i want to be safe so it's really good and ensuring like hearing that from growers too is just you know like we're doing all that we can um maybe I'm, i didn't understand who you were but i'm glad you're a resource for this because I didn't necessarily understand it fully or whatever it is, whatever the response to it is. Um, I think that's just been a kind of overall barrier, nice barrier, and they're glad that this is a resource in Michigan. Mm -hmm. so. I had sort of three quick things come to mind. One is um, that uh, the School Nutrition Association of Michigan has a toolkit at their website, and at 10 cents a meal under tools for schools, we also have a link to it, and that's called Take Your Legislator to Lunch. And so it's inviting legislators to actually come into the cafeteria so they, they can see what school food service directors are doing with locally grown food. And um, so, and Senator Wayne Schmidt, who has been leading the effort this year on 10 cents a meal, one of the things he said to me, okay, now, after this passes, you need to make sure those schools just invite their legislators to lunch so they can see this happening. Mm -hmm. So something as simple as that, you know, is something that has, I've seen, you know, really makes a difference. And the food service director's a little nervous about doing it, but the legislators are like, you know, I want to see it in, in action. And... Um, Senator Hansen, who headed up that committee before Senator Schmidt did, I didn't really know that well. I've known Senator Schmidt for years because I was at the newspaper here for 12 years and covered him as a county commissioner and things like that. I didn't know Senator Hansen that well, and I was very interested in talking to him as he was leaving office to find that those stories where he went into the schools made a lot of difference for him. At first, he wasn't quite sure about this. You know, he was, he both was someone who, um, his, uh, his family has been in the grocery business and in ag areas for years. And so he understands that we've sort of broken the, the, um, business chain of having you know more local farms get into distribution trucks that get to stores and it's like he knew enough about the system to be a little skeptical about whether or not it could even really work 
of getting local farm products into schools or to grocery stores or wherever. And there's a lot of work being done on that side of the equation to reconnect um, the farmers to the sources with some middlemen who are devoted to really making that connection happen. By the end of it, he was just so impressed with hearing the stories of the food service directors who he knew were putting a little extra work to make it work. And same with the farmers. And he was interviewed by some students, which is a whole other story that could take up more time. But he, would, he wanted to be interviewed by these students. He allowed us at the last Michigan Good Food Summit um, to have a video of teenagers from the culinary program at Career Tap in Muskegon who have been integrated in with some of the Ten Cents program and the school systems there, they talked to him about it and he told them how much it meant to him, what he was seeing, and he said, you need to be the voices on it. You need to be out there, you know, making sure that you educate legislators so that they know the impact. So he also was sort of trying to tell people, don't be afraid. We, we need to hear from you. You know, we really and truly do need to hear from you. And the final thing, I guess, is, that I'll tell is being down in Battle Creek, I was at a meeting with a lot of different food service directors, um, advocates, food corps. Uh, I can't remember who else was in the room, but people who wanted to know about 10 cents so they, they would know if they then wanted to advocate for it. And I learned then for the first time that every ISD has a government affairs person. And um, and I invited that person at the suggestion of someone else. He wondered what in the world he was doing in this meeting about food service. But when it got to the end, and the food service directors were like, well, I've never contacted the legislator. I don't know how to do that. And he's like, oh, really? <laughs> I know how to do that. I do that all the time. And he became the mentor for those food service directors. He set up a meeting with the legislators. They took a trip you know, to Lansing to talk to legislators. Um, in Kalamazoo, that happened the opposite, where I talked to the staff in, in a legislator's office because Healthy Kids Healthy Michigan connected me to them. I had spoken with a number of people in the Kalamazoo area, same kind of stakeholders, and that staff said, can you set the, the um, legislator up with people in the community, and I could, and that legislature actually did it when she was in district, and they had a meeting. But they really do want to meet with their own constituents. Like I said, I just set the table for it, but they want to hear from people in their communities. They really do. I would add, you said every school district has a government? Intermediate school district. Oh, uh, ISD, do you know yeah, about yeah, ISD? Yeah. Yeah. Is, that, is that all of the intermediate school districts? Really? Yes. Unfortunately, some do not. I would know. I see. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're doing wrong. <laughs> I don't know everyone, everyone I've come in contact with so far. Yeah, so, yeah. anyway, it depends on like, the number of schools in the district mm -hmm. and the whole community. But that would be amazing if we had that. It really. <laughs> well, but if you're in a rural community, aren't you in an ISD that represents multiple counties? Yes, we represent Mark Kent, Georgia counties. Okay. Hmm. Well, Traverse Bay Area Intermediate School District, for example, around here represents 10 counties, and uh -huh. um, and they have one person who does that, but then, um, you know, there's a Calhoun ISD, just one ISD, but because it's, yeah. maybe because it's a higher population area and things like that, but they've got someone on staff there, and, um, yeah. I was about to ask, yes, yeah, incredible. Mm -hmm. um, I'm from Genesee County, I'm from Flint. Mm -hmm. My um, so that was I thought that was really interesting. And my other question, um, inviting legislators to lunch and you know, trying to get people more involved. Um, sometimes what we run into when we're like inviting people to come and visit a school or um, to come and talk to somebody or do something, what we run into is we've got different layers of people that are um, we have different layers of leadership, basically, for schools. We have the, like the, uh, the, the Board of Education, we've got the Principals and Administration, and then we have our organization that's like the convener for lots of partners in the school. So we have all these different layers of leadership. Mm -hmm. And if we wanted to do something like, oh, let's bring the legislator to lunch, we would have all these layers of leadership 
that would be like, okay, we have to make sure that these kids are in the room when those people are there so they have the most well-behaved kids, they have the best lunch, they have the best teachers talking to them. So they don't get an actual experience of what it's really like on just a regular day. Yes. They get a performance almost. That's true. And so I was curious, what, how do you try to get them, uh, what do you do to try to get the most authentic, um, like close to reality experience for them when you're saying come to the school and learn about food, for instance, and a lot of what I talk to do is uh, around physical activity, but so, like if I were to invite a staffer or a legislator or something, it'd probably be easier with a staffer, but as soon as somebody knows that it's, oh, this is an important person, let's, let's do all these things that we normally do not do mm -hmm. <laughs> in order to give them this experience that is a false reality. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, so like what do you do about that? How do you, well, I don't know about all of the schools in Genesee County, but Flint Community Schools did have 10 cents last year, mm -hmm. and they got a late start utilizing it. Um, uh, they started in about January, but uh, I know they've got food poor there. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. and so they are genuinely doing some activities, and I know that food court is going to be connecting with food service even more closely in this coming year. And so, I mean, it, it all depends on what it is that you want to share. If what you want to share is, you know, the lunch time, there's not near enough time for the kids to eat, mm -hmm. you're going to want to show them on a really happy day or something like that. But if you are trying to show them that, you know, we have increased the amount of fresh foods that we've got in our salad bar, and, um, when I paid a visit, you know, there was some signage on, on some of the salad bars in terms of the local yeah. food coming from the Flint Fresh Food Hub and things like that. Um, Jim Anich has, you know, provided me with the, through his office with a quote of support about things and some meals in the year of it. Um, and so, in a way, it is a show. It's trying to show, you know, you know what you're really doing, but that gets back to my dual message mm -hmm. of you want to have the program, but you also want to really support your schools and success. And so to start to make that less of a show and more of reality of what's really, really happening is a big part of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm at the Crib Fitness Foundation, and we have the three board members, and we we're the lead agency on mm -hmm. uh, partnerships for the Flint School. So mm -hmm. the Community Education Initiative, the Crib is the lead agency. Right. So I know a lot about like kind of what's happening in there, but I'm a different part of the organization. Mm -hmm. So I'm not directly connected to the education piece. But my, um, I think my biggest concern is, is if we want to show how hectic it is and you know how they don't have enough time, that will get pushed back from the school because they don't want to be shown in a negative light. And so they'll like sit in the lunch hour and then Jim and I, who like lives in my neighborhood, you know, like so I know that these guys like John Sherry, I know these guys are, are accessible because I can go down the street and talk to them, or like I can see John Sherry walk his dog and stop him and ask him questions and say, come to the school. But as soon as the school, we have to get all these approvals and like we have to get approvals of can we take pictures and all kinds of stuff. What classroom, what teacher? The teachers are not allowed to speak to the press unless they have been approved and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. So if we invite them to see how there's such a small window of time for them to get good food or come and see how kids are throwing away the healthy food that we give them, how do we try to help them stop doing that? What schools, sometimes they don't want to be seen negatively because there's a lot of negative press around Flint. So what they'll do is they'll, they'll basically, they'll, um, you know, like when you have a football team, you put all your stars in the, in the in the game, so they'll be like, oh, let's put all the kids who like healthy food in the lunch, in the lunch hour, <laughs> because Jim is in the gym and so here, so get all the kids who don't throw away their healthy food to be there and say how much they love it, or let's, oh, let's give them like an extra 10 minutes for lunch, because we don't want them to see that they don't have enough time. So, like, how do you, do you, well, I guess, again, that is, what is your goal? I guess, you know, if, yeah. if the food service 
doesn't want to show them the happiness. Yeah. If they're not wanting that, yeah. then maybe that's not what you're yeah. bringing them Maybe my actual question is, how do you convince the food service people to be, <laughs> to be like, yeah, we want to show them that? Maybe that's my, maybe that's the actual question, is how do you get the school to say, oh, yeah, you're right, we don't give them enough time, we need to, I mean, I guess maybe that's my real question. It's like, it's more, it's not their fault, even though they right. might take some personal pride in it. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's, it's a structural issue, and if we're not actually talking about it, or like seeing it, there's no way we can actually address it. Yeah. But, and I'm asking all those questions, yeah. who doesn't do the work in the school, but I work with the, the food person, and she couldn't be here today, and she's like, take notes for me. And she's a former food court person, and she's really interested in the, getting into the food more of the food director work like you just talked about. Mm -hmm. She shouldn't be here, so she's like, hey, thanks. I don't have to talk to you a little bit more detail. I thought I'd have to miss that I got presented another one, but I'd love to talk to you. Yeah, absolutely. About Thank you. I also think it's important to recognize like that the food service directors like recognize the risk, right? They're not doing it because they like don't care mm -hmm. that they, they're like, legitimately scared that politicians will cut their funding right and so i think part of it too is like acknowledging that like they are coming from like true fear of the like the negative consequences of policy um right like they it's not that they don't want anonymous to see it's that they're scared that anonymous is going to tell his colleagues and they're going to be like well screw Flint public like schools chop that funding right like there's like they're funded through the state, and, and maybe it's going to super kill you too. Like they're scared of the the negative repercussions. So if there are yeah. ways to like also be really conscious that like policy has negative consequences, and um, and just like not just like blowing through that, but really like digging into what it what would the negative consequence be, <coughs> and how can you like try to mitigate that in a site visit? Like, because those can be really performative, but usually from fear. Yeah. And you know, if you do still, if if the food service does not say something like yeah. Tansen to me, you know, to be able to be honest, to say to say that here are the kids who like it. We're seeing these yeah. results of kids. I mean, what I heard from the food service director, not the director, but I forget her name now, unfortunately, but um, person who's carrying a lot of this out and is working with Flint Fresh Food Hub a lot is being amazed at all of the different varieties of apple flavors and is working with the Flint Fresh Food Hub to be able to have apple slices now instead of the prepackaged ones that she can get through the commodity system. And she really likes that and has had a good reaction from kids. So that's an honest story. And if she can create a genuine relationship with the legislature, she can say, but you know, I don't want to fool you and say that every single kid is taking it. And here are some reasons why that may be complex, and we would really like to have more. We have food court coming in here and doing these amazing taste tests with our kids or garden education activities with our kids. And when they do that, we see changes. But look at what a big school system we are. We need more of these kind of educators. If that's the kind of messaging, you know, yeah. so that you can be positive about the one thing that you do want to keep. If you don't want to. Right. The sense of, okay, well, we don't want 10 cents a meal because it's not proven 100% with all of the kids. Yes, it's making a difference, and then we could build on it even more if there was some funding for educational activities so we could also spread food court throughout all of our school buildings or something like that. So I need to have Billy call you guys and talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll all right. Thank you all. Can you join me in thanking our team?